we're in the middle of, of doing some research at the moment, so we don't we don't have a huge amount of stats in terms of of uh, feedback. Um, but I can give a good picture of, of where we were, where we are, and, and, and where we think we're heading. Um, first of all, obviously, it's been a tumultuous year for, for all of us. Um, we streamed more than 250 concerts uh, by 400 artists. And at this stage, we've had 7 million viewers uh, online and many millions of radio listeners across the globe. And uh, we welcomed live audiences back on Monday, two or three days ago, for a 25 concert uh, reopening festival, which also uh, coincides with our uh, 120th anniversary. So going back to, to the closure on the 16th of March uh, last year, obviously responding to the pandemic and attempting to minimize its impact on uh, our performers and on our audiences um, have been the, the dual tasks uh, which all of us at Wigmore Hall have been dedicated to right throughout the past 14 months. And given the uncertain prospects regarding musical performance, we immediately began to consider uh, how we might maintain those strong relationships with musicians and with audiences alike. And we started to explore the most practical role that we could uh, play in helping uh, to bring uh, music uh, to, to audiences and uh, a bit of joy and consolation uh, as well. So uh, this goes back to 2012. The story goes back to 2012 when we said very clearly that every arts organization had the potential to become its own broadcaster and whatever that meant. Um, by 2015, we had uh, invested in, in a very uh, significant digital stroke broadcast infrastructure. And if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been able to respond um, as quickly as we did. And uh, we broadcast in conjunction with Radio 3 20 concerts uh, last June, and that was kind of breaking the silence. They were the first live performances uh, from an empty hall in the UK. Uh, what's, what's very clear is that we have, we have probably super served an existing audience internationally, um, but they weren't entirely known to us. So our mailing list has gone off by about a quarter of a million people. That's on our free mailing list. And our membership has gone up by 50%. Now, even in a good year, if membership goes up by two or 3%, uh, that's, that's a huge result. So clearly this, this has had a wide impact. Uh, we didn't have a paywall, and I think that was the right decision because what has actually happened, publicly we've declared at this stage, one million pounds in donations from people texting us and sending small donations during concerts anything between five and 25 pounds. Uh, and that, that came in at about a million pounds. Beyond that, uh, wealthier donors sent checks for 10, 20, 30 grand, many of them unknown to us before. So had we actually put up a paywall, we wouldn't be in the position we're in now. And all of that has allowed us to broadcast from an empty hall and to pay those 400 artists their full fees. Um, so we're really glad that we didn't use a paywall. What the future will bring and what that will do in terms of numbers, we haven't worked out yet. But certainly in terms of our strategy, in terms of getting, to, getting through the year and possibly for a year or two ahead, um, we won't be streaming at anything like the volume because it was almost seven days a week um, that, that we did in, in the height of the pandemic. Um, that's, that's been a huge result. So organization-wide, just thinking of that impact on, on membership, on, on, on new members, probably existing music lovers. Interestingly, uh, the YouTube audience we know, because that bit we have been able to look at, is 40% uh, under 40. And uh, again, the membership that has come into us, the new membership, is, is younger than, than our traditional Wigmore membership. And interestingly, we've retained 90% of the old membership. So what we, what we, need to think about and what we're beginning to think about of course is that we uh there is an audience out there clearly from those figures that will never come to Wigmore Hall and uh because 40 percent of the audience is from the United States uh about 30 percent um from Europe and and 20 percent only uh home based and then the remaining 10 percent dotted dotted around the world so that's very interesting so when we reopen properly we'll be very conscious of the fact that we're we're trying to serve hopefully a new audience that has come through uh, this digital route that will actually buy tickets and attend concerts. But clearly there's an audience there 
that may never come to Wigmore Hall or, or will visit us very rarely because they live far from the hall. And we've been inundated with letters and emails from people asking us just to keep streaming going, don't abandon it. And we have no intention of abandoning it, but it won't be seven days a week. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got to say that, that a paywall, I think, wouldn't have allowed us particularly reach those those significant new donors and, and tap into that significant goodwill for music and for musicians. And, and partly, I suspect, the, the emotive message around the fact that, that we wanted to pay artists their full fees and keep them in employment. And remember, some of the ensembles that we employed came to us two or three times uh, in the pandemic and, and uh, made it quite clear to us that, that this was their only income, actually, certainly in the first uh, six to eight months. Um, so, so all that has been very important. Uh, just in terms of giving you an idea of, of the, the uh, staffing required to do this, um, very often, uh, in fact, most, most of our, our streams are shared either with Radio 3, uh, they're offered to Radio 3, or they're shared internationally. We don't, we don't always say who we're sharing them with. So the streams have to double up as a radio broadcast. Um, so that's limited some of what we're able to do around the concerts. Um, and also at the beginning, social distancing. And what I mean by that is some, some of the add-ons that you could have, like little Q&As with the, the artists, that sort of thing. We can look at that in the future. There is no hurry. But, you know, this, this has done what it needed to do and, and more than that. So we have, we have a presenter who's usually a, a radio presenter or somebody who has worked for radio who can do both jobs for us. Um, we have two production managers. We have a digital content officer. And that's very interesting because they're... That, that person is, is, is answering queries and engaging online with our audience across Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and, and, and talking to them during the concert. And, and, and that's very important. There's a production assistant. Obviously, there's a producer. Uh, there's a director, stroke vision mixer. There's a camera supervisor. Uh, there's broadcast sound. And there's a score reader. And, and the score reader actually doesn't have to be uh, backstage at the hall. Indeed, at the very beginning, we were operating with only two or three staff backstage and everybody else was, was working uh, remotely uh, from home. Uh, so that, that just gives an idea of where, where we think we are and, 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 and what's happened. Uh, going beyond that then, the learning program has, that was very important to bring online and, and that's had a huge impact and, you know, Thanks to that ongoing support of donors, the learning program moved in April 2020, um, and we were able to connect with people to people um, without digital means uh, via telephone, uh, wherever possible. But we, we also developed a digital and, and digital and physical resources to reach those communities um, with whom we work, uh, who have become even more isolated uh, throughout lockdown. And um, we've been able to reach out to people living with dementia and their carers, to young people um, with autism spectrum disorders, young people and women and families at risk from uh, domestic abuse and homelessness. Um, and uh, in a way that we would never have thought possible uh, before the pandemic. So we've maintained contact with schools and care homes. Um, and whilst not being able to provide that in-person service, we've supported them with online resources where they where we could and our learning department have worked very hard on that and I'm, I'm very surprised actually at how, how successful that has been particularly around people living with dementia I didn't think that would work um, but but it has they are they are engaging um, with with uh, on-screen activity and also there was a huge spike in domestic violence uh, in the early stages of the pandemic so the work that we would normally do in person with women's refuge centres, with family refuge centres in, in, in London. Um, that was vital that we, we found a way of doing that online and that's been very much appreciated. So uh, the overall total in terms of what this brought in, in terms of goodwill and fundraising is 3.3 million pounds. So uh, I, I've, I've publicly mentioned the one million pound figure. Soon we'll mention the whole figure. So you're, you're amongst the first to hear that today. And, uh, but that again, it, it, it doesn't suggest that if we take down uh, or that if we put up a paywall um, that this would have the same sort of impact and indeed colleagues I'm talking to internationally are saying that with a paywall they're getting on average between 500 and 2,000 views um, 
usually around the £10 mark for a live event. And the numbers seem to be going down rather than up. So, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of work that we all need to do, and none of us have the answers uh, to that. Clearly, digital is, is part of all of our futures. It's, it's been central to getting through the, the pandemic. Um, in a normal year, with 550 concerts in the hall, we would raise £2.5 million in fundraising. And most of that comes in to support concerts directly. So to, to have got to a figure that's, that's, that's higher than normal, um, to have doubled membership and to have increased the non-paying uh, mailing list, which is essentially where, where the low hanging fruit is for, for a new physical audience, um, all that's been very important. And uh, as time goes on, when we don't always have to double up as a radio broadcast, we will look to see what we can do um, in terms of just uh, add-ons. So, as I said, those Q&As um, with, uh, with the artists, maybe a little insight, more insight, more accessible insight in, into the repertoire, um, maybe some pre-concert events, uh, all of that sort of thing online. And um, also reducing some of the, some of the concerts, just, just showing uh, individual movements or individual works um, has also uh, done very well for us on, on, on social media. So we're looking at all of that. So we, we're, we're, we're asking ourselves lots of questions. We're asking our colleagues lots of questions. We're looking at all of the data uh, coming in uh, from colleagues and from various audience research agencies. And, and from that, uh, we will work out uh, the best possible way forward. But certainly for the foreseeable future, we'll just continue as we are. And um, I think I should leave it there, really. <laughs>